everybody to this um, event on social fragmentation in Catalonia. And um, I will introduce, my name is Mary Caldor, and I run the Civil Society and Conflict Research Unit here at the LSC. And um, I'm going to start with two people um, who have written a paper together. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, Adolf Tobena and Albert Satora have written a paper together for Policy Network, which is a sort of social democrat network, called Pathways and Legacies of the Secessionist Push in Catalonia. And I don't know which is your Albert. Adolf. You're and Albert. And this is Albert. <laughs> and so, as I understand it, Albert is a statistician and a professor at the University of Pompeii Fab in Barcelona. And Adolf is a neurobiologist also yeah. in Barcelona. Yeah. So that's great. So they come from very different fields, but they're writing about secession in Catalonia. Yeah. And they're going to, I don't know, how are you going to do the presentation together? I will start. You will start. Five minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> Great. So I will hand over to you and then I'll introduce you two when I get to you. Okay. Great. So I can start? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jeffrey. Thank you. So. Do you have slides? Yeah. Because then I might have to move, so yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. Ready, you want to sit on the desk? Yeah, I'm going to sit over here. Okay. There's a third uh, author of this paper for Policy Network that, by the way, the real academic paper appeared last week in Palgrave Communications. You'll find there, with all the methods and statistics duly explained, because the policy network is an essay uh, for a general audience. And the third author is Josa Maria Oyer, uh, who is a professor of statistics at the University of Barcelona. And I come from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. So uh, it's a paper written by uh, professors from the probably the, the three most important universities in in Catalonia, not only in Barcelona, but in Catalonia. So it's a, it's, it's a joint venture. My my part, I decided to. Oh, I see. Yeah. Can we? Shall we turn the lights down? Oh, a little bit, not completely. <laughs> because I like to see your faces. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. I decided to, uh, to use this title for my introduction. From feasts to clashes, the Catalonia pathway to social fracture, because that story started <coughs> as a feast. It's a tremendous feast, but now we have, we have entered into the period of clashes, serious clashes, sometimes not so serious other times. Uh, next. If it comes. Yeah. Catalonia it's is here. It's in this corner <coughs> of the uh, Iberian Peninsula, for those who don't remember. Uh, and uh, it's on the Mediterranean, but across the Pyrenees. The southern part, the Spanish part, has secession troubles, capital Barcelona. But the northern part, which is rather small, capital Perpignan, is quiet and very happy to uh, continue to remain a remote province of France. And I think it's useful to keep this contrast between the two Catalonia.
come to the next. Yeah. So the appearance of uh, the secessionist uh, movement in Catalonia, in Spanish Catalonia, it was a surprise, it was a tremendous surprise for almost everybody, even for us, Catalan people. Uh, and probably the, the most outstanding facts that were behind the surprise were two. One is the beauty and the magnificence of the demonstrations, of the street demonstrations. The secessions in Catalonia have uh, uh, organized fantastic choreographic, uh, beautiful uh, demonstrations that have captivated the entire world for good reasons, because they are very good. And that probably they are the best, even better than the Koreans. <laughs> <laughs> In the second was the second element for the surprise was the rapid escalation of the phenomenon. Because uh, only ten years ago, uh, 2010, support for secession bred it was below 20%, around 15%. And this, in two years, went to 50%. And particularly, the abruptness occurred in one year, 2012. In one year. And that's a, an unexplained, a completely unexpected an unexplained phenomenon. And then it receded a little bit, but has been maintaining the support for the cessation with minor oscillations at around 40%. So, what I usually call cataxic troubles <laughs> uh, is a unique experiment that has several characteristics, and they are listed here in my view. Uh, the first one, it's massive, colorful street demonstrations that they continue when they want to organize them. Second, a disobedient regional government and a disobedient uh, autonomous parliament. It's not my qualification, it's their qualifications. <clears throat> Even the lawyers who were defending uh, the leaders of the secessionist parties who are now uh, in prison, and they were accepting that they were disobeying continuously. So it's not a qualification, you see, an acceptation. Okay, third, a stern media propaganda, particularly from the, from the uh, different radios, TVs, channels, social networks, uh, under the control of the regional government. Uh, fourth, const constant social and contextual pressure against everybody. Uh, five, two illegal pseudo-referendums. They were able to organize two, not only one, two illegal pseudo-referendums of self-determination. And five, a proclamation of independence, a, f a fully declaration of, uh, of independence, at the parliament by the president then of Catalonia that failed. And that, that has occurred without uh, the support of the social majority of the region and within a democratic country inside the European Union amid a, a society, a context which is open, tolerant, and advanced, and has produced a divided society. A society <coughs> that wasn't divided, now it's completely divided, deeply divided. And uh, this is divided on the issue of secession, uh, and the region now is formed by almost a half of secessionists and uh, a bit more than half of unionists. Unionist in Spain and Catalonia is an insult, but 
this only happens in Catalonia and Spain. In all the world, it's not an insult. That's the reason that we use uh, the, uh, the name unionist, just uh, for facilitating understanding. So that's the situation. Then the, 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 the question is, this was a gross-rated phenomenon and a spontaneous phenomenon that was born uh, from who knows the reasons, but essentially from a deep aspiration of the people there, or was an elite-induced secession push and organized from the top. That we are aware that it's the typical question that political scientists have never resolved for any conflict. That, that's my impression. Um, but uh, we've done uh, uh, research, a longitudinal research on all the data that the official survey agency of the Catalonian government, this is official data, all the data that regularly produces the uh, official agency for service of the Catalonian government from 20, uh, 2006 to last July. And Albert Satora will present the specifics of that. And in that data, we have elements, we have hints, that permit to uh, be close to the response of that, to their response of that. But I promised you that I will be brief, and I'm, I'm going to uh, finish immediately. <laughs> so, uh, measuring that the difference between secessionism and union is not by surveys, but by electoral results, the difference is 150,000 votes. In the last two regional elections, the difference between one part of the uh, region and the other parts is only that. I skipped that, I skipped that, and I skipped all that, I skipped that, and I go to here. Okay. In 2014, I wrote an essay uh, advancing my view because at that time, even at that time, even before our data, there was enough data on the different distribution of the uh, supporters of a possible uh, uh, secession against the enemies of secession and the distribution of the majoritarian languages. Spanish versus Catalan, and the segmentations of economic classes. That data was available there, and I advanced that hypothesis. This is because there were, there were an enormous quantity of conjectures about the origins of that. that a very special thing that didn't happen in Bavaria, in Wales, in Brittany, in Corsica, in Sicilia, in Palania, <coughs> or in Catalonia, or in Galicia, or in the Canary Islands, it only, hap only happened at that. So I advanced that. It's an example of a struggle, uh, domestic and nationalistic, but the characteristic that defines that struggle, that litigation, is that it goes along an ethnocultural frontier, and particularly along an ethno-linguistic an ethno frontier. Hmm. I, was, I was looking for my water, but there is no water. So I have to salivate. <laughs> okay. So, I skip that, 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 all that, 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 not all, the, all those who are previous data to produce that hypothesis. And now, even Mr. Piketty, who is a tremendously respected leftist French uh, economist, in his last book last week, 
uh, it seems to me that it hasn't arrived uh, to the uh, bookstores still. He is reproducing uh, what I was saying. The, uh, the division in Catalonia runs not only on different territorial distribution of people and different linguistic distribution of people, but also on different economic uh, power of people. And the, the secessionists or the rich, they are rich rebels, where, uh, whereas the non-secessionists or the poorest uh, classes of Catalonia. And he uh, presents the secessionist movement as a form of social of fiscal egoism. Uh, another characteristic, a final thing, eh, that uh, is curious, that is that secessionists deny. They deny that there is a division continuously, and they put an enormous propaganda to deny that. This is the last survey. You can see that the secessionists, the black in this coloration, this is from a, a, a very well known. Uh, of um, survey agency in, in Spain. They say, no, no, Catalonia is not divided into houses, 43%. But the rest of Catalans, 57%, they say, yes, it's completely divided. So, to finish my part, uh, before uh, all the material that Albert is going to present to you, uh, <coughs> we um, conclude in previous work that the secessionists compared to Unionists are more politically engaged and they are more passionate and they are mu much more determined and convinced of attaining, of attaining the, their goals. They have a narrower and a stronger national identification, more homogeneous uh, linguistic habits and their media consumption preference are highly restricted to the regional bubble. They are more affluent and their economic per perspectives are superior as well. So they pertain to privileged segments of society and they are much more fertilized. All these foundations predict of the chronification of the challenge. So the secessionist passion is alive, very active within a fractured society. So the conflict is going to continue, and the clashes, the clashes finally have arrived. Many thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> a very last chair, because I've allowed the five minutes to extend to 20 minutes. Okay. And I hope but everybody else won't follow your example because otherwise there will be no time. So now I hand over to you. I hope you can be 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thanks, Mr. I will say that there was, for me personally, was a very good positive side of this conflict. I ended meeting uh, Rolf working with him <laughs> and uh, and the colleagues uh, have been working on these projects um, so I should find the my slides Okay, so I don't have to. I'm being introduced. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure, first of all, to, uh, as I said, to work with my colleagues and, uh, on that. And, that, and, uh, to, and thanks to, uh, to the people who attend uh, about Catalonia, who wants to know about Catalonia, and uh, in this scenario of the LSD, and I thank the organizer for taking us here. So, dimensions. Uh, I'm going to go down, to descend to the, 
to the ground of the data. And uh, uh, it's probably in dimensions and the persistence along time. And I put a picture. Um, this is a town which I know very much because it's a town where I have my house from 18th or 17th century house. And uh, there's all the flags except one, the Spanish one. And it really says, a Kesta bandera uh, and this uh, in Pusada is the forest. <coughs> this flag <laughs> is imposed to us. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so uh, in my house, well, in, in, in Barcelona, uh, also, uh, there is yesterday, this Spanish flag, another neighbor, the independentist flag. By the way, the independentist flag uh, was was also this is a, is the is the is the um, ayuntamiento town hall town hall. So the independent flag was posted in the ayuntamiento, but yeah. fortunately my camera couldn't download. <laughs> Uh, these days, but anyway, uh, and this is the clashes that uh, at the university that I also know a lot is UPS. People trying to get in, people with masks resisting because there was the university was close. So the two, there it is. That didn't happen uh, on the time of the feast. Okay, I'm going to talk about the yeah, work which is in this, uh, well, John uh, Italy, and with uh, Jose Marie Ollier, which is also the fortunate comrade I got in, co in touch, uh, thanks to the process, uh, in fact. Um, joining Air Force. Uh, the paper in Policy Network and the paper in Power of Communications of the group nature that mention it at all. This is what, in open access, is what. Um, we tried to uncover and from years ago, uh, uncovering uh, Catalonian divides. Maybe that's my bias for being a statistics. I don't believe on the meaning. I believe on finding the difference among and, and, and finding the variables that, because it's the way to explain, not to prove causality, which is impossible to prove, but to be able to approach. And uh, we have registered data, and we will concentrate on survey data. I would go register data, this is the first map uh, we call the balcony of Catalonia, where the municipalities, uh, on the intensity of the constitutional, there was an elaborated an index, and then we see that the intensity of session falls down and gets against the Catalonian, the towns which are urban. That's the, it doesn't get against Madrid, it gets against one part of Catalonia. It falls down the secession. This is aggregated data computed from all the register. I don't, but this is explained also that one propaganda of secessionists has been gathering many mayors. The point is that 78% of the, of the mayors accounts for only 25% of the population of Catalonia, while 25% of the 22% of the municipalities account for 75. So there is a, a way to 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 sell uh, unanimity, but. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on the survey data, and the survey data is 45 surveys taken from the source is the Generalitat de Catalunya, uh, is tied to the Ministry of the Presidency. They have a lot of uh, frequent surveys and barometer opinion publica. And we have 88,000 respondents along uh, the year 2006 to 2019. Uh, yeah, 
secession, yes or not, that would be one in 2018. But the point is that this is stability of um, yes or no, the yes in red, are below the 50% and above 40%. It's a stable from 15 to 19. The point is that secession question is asked only since 15. So we wanted to study the evolution before the process started. So we had to search for other variables in the survey. And we found one variable, which is sense of belonging. The question being asked, how much, how do you feel? You feel only Catalan, or feel more Catalan than Spanish, or feel equally Catalan than Spanish, or more Spanish, or only Spanish? That is a variable that we see that predicts the vote of independence, and that is available till 2006. That was our variable to get, to use. And then we also speculated, we didn't know about family mother language. How, which language do you speak when you were a child? They responded to that. And that's another variable. And regional media following, which media do you follow? The traditional channels, TV, or radio, or any other. We recorded that. And uh, support of the session, this is the variable that we say. And then the major divide. <coughs> that was striking to see that family modern language uh, is what we would see. Here it is. You see, we take. Catalan citizens, Catalan citizens, which family modern language is Catalan, they are here. The level of 70-80 on support of secession. If we take those whose modern language, something that you cannot take out of these people because it's like the color of the eyes and is a richness of Catalonia, they are here. A stable on this period of 15 to 19. So let's take the sense of belonging and let's see from before 15. And here it is, the picture. That's a very interesting picture, which is people who have sense of belonging only Catalan is this color. They is increased in the period, and especially in 2012, starts an increase. People who are we are interested in two. The extreme to be only Catalan, to feel only Catalan, and the other to be equally Catalan than Spanish, because that's what we need in the society. People feel Catalan and feel Spanish. We want that. And it was before uh, was the percentage was the dominant, the, the dominant one. The dominant one. And this descendant, it has been negotiated. And it has been an increment of what is extreme. Fortunately, it has not been an, 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 an increase of only Spanish. No. That's all, this is the only two that we are interested in. Let's cut by family, my family mother language. Let's cut by that variable. And here is the impressive graph. This is the most impressive graph I have ever seen in my statistics life. You see, people whose modern language is Catalan, 38.5% is the number that appeared in Adolf, escalated to only Catalan. When? 2012 is directing line. And what we most appreciate, probably what we want most like, the dual erosion. That's for the segment, those pe Catalan people who only speak Catalan. Sorry, whose modern language is Catalan. Let's see the others. No move, practically. A slight erosion is 55.6% of the Catalan citizens. They have an, well, there is some erosion on the dual, so it's the loss. There is some escalation 
on Domi Catalan, but is minimum and is some kind of saying, uh, some kind of saying the, there is a kind of immunology to the passing of this phenomenon. So let's see whether there is other variables associated with these changes. And we search for many influence. That variable, whether they watch uh, TV, regional, or radio, or others. And then we combine that language and media, and we see that Catalan, and family modern language Catalan, and I watch regional media, they get this tremendous escalation. And uh, the Spanish also, the Spanish that the people, Catalan citizens whose family mother language is, is Spanish, they watch TV, they also get escalation. Mm, well, the Spanish that doesn't see the others, and by the way, these are the major groups. And these, in fact, the, the bands, these are bands, uh, which these are very narrow because these are the highest uh, group, the Spanish and modern language that doesn't watch uh, regional media, but the ones that watch, these are uh, uh, small, and uh, so you can see that it's small because it's more, the band, 95% bound is, is wider because it fluctuates more, it, it gets this increase. So, uh, and for the other variable, dual, being a Spanish and Catalan, that we also see that um, there is this descent of the Spanish people with regional, that, that uh, Spanish speaking uh, family, uh, speaking, mother family speaking uh, Spanish, that they see the regional media, they get a descent, and uh, there is. Uh, for the others, there is a stability and, uh, and also the descent of Catalan uh, uh, family mother language, Catalan versus the other. So this act, uh, uh, there is association with the media. And uh, finally, uh, well, here we can get oh, that. It has to be said that regional media only uh, uses Catalan language yeah. to complement that, yeah. okay? Yeah. So people who follow regional media only listen or, or watch uh, elements in Catalan language, okay? If I, somebody wants to land in Barcelona and finds a Catalan in the state and wants to see whether the Catalan is a session or not, there is a simple model. Ask, uh, well, check whether the mother tongue is Catalan and whether uh, they, they, mother tongue Spanish don't see much uh, regional media and this is the people. The, the, the area is the proportion of the share in the population of this group of people, the D. Uh, the C, there is mother tongue Spanish, but they watch the media. There is an English. The mother tongue uh, Catalan and media, there is also an increase. And the mother tongue Catalan and as well and media, then there is. Uh, the, the, the proportion goes from 60% to 86. The so, increase is, is support for secession. The increase is support for secession in this ground. Yeah. Okay? Yes. yes, because the, 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 the proportion, the high, is the probability that they vote for secession, for support of secession. So this, uh, there is in the power grade, we show the dynamic graph, the evolution of the, these A to C groups, how they evolution, and we also always see that there is a fundamental point, 25N, which is the elections in 2012, where uh, the Nationalistic Party adopted the, the strategy or, or the or adhered to the secessionists, that is always in the middle of the oscillation among the years. 
So, and Kate, it's so interesting, yeah. but you've already had 20 minutes to... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, let me... Okay. Uh, in concluding, if you want to allow me... Yeah. In concluding. Uh, erosion of dual sense of belonging, dramatic increase of, of trends of sense of belonging for only the, 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 for the Catalans, uh, uh, modern language. Uh, uh, fortunately, good deal with no increase of the sentiment of belonging on the Spanish. There is association. Well, it's, uh, I think the conclusions. But let me uh, this point uh, the, to note: uh, it's a high percentage of population in Catalonia that speaks uh, modern tongue. Family modern tongue is Spanish. Spanish. Uh, public media is only in Catalan. Catalan language is mandatory in the school. Uh, myself at the university, I am others, I teach in Catalan. I never had any restrictions on that. Well, it's with the people in, in, in uh, course in English. But there is, that's something to know. And maybe my personal opinion, if you allow me. This November, a few days ago, receiving the prize Francisco Cercedo in journalism, the Catalan writer Javier Cerca said, in those days of September, miles de catalanes nos hemos sentido solos. We felt alone. And thank, and thanks the king for his words, you are not alone. That were addressed in October 3. Yes, that was the case. Some people we felt we do not understand how the generalitat of Catalonia and other republic institutions are not neutral on an issue that is so critical for our life and in which Catalan citizens are so divided. And we feel abandoned by the generalitat, an institution that should represent all the Catalans and that is itself in such a partisan position. That's the the view of many Catalans, not of all, but many, eh, about one which is this uh, Javier Cercas, myself, and many colleagues. Um, other reference I put live here, and uh, that's it. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> and for, for the, uh, <laughs> understand how you feel <laughs> about the bias of our institutions. <laughs> so I'm going to um, switch my papers. I'm going to ask Caroline to come next. And I'm really sorry that we've gone on. I've allowed everybody to go on too long, but I hope you can stick to 10 minutes. Yes, I will try my best to stick to 10 minutes. Let me just tell you, Caroline is lecturer in politics and Spanish at Aston University in Birmingham and co-director of the Aston Center for Europe. And she specializes in nationalist movements and she's written a book called Nationalist Politics and Regional Financing System in the Basque country and Catalonia. Thank you. Okay, I will try and stick to my 10 minutes. And I feel slightly awkward as a Brit talking to what looks like an audience mainly of Spaniards and Catalans, so I apologise if I've made any mistakes in my understanding of things. Um, I haven't got slides because I'm not a quantitative person. Uh, my, the impressions that I have formed over time are based on a lot of interviews I've conducted over the years in Barcelona and in Madrid with politicians representing the full spectrum of parties, um, both statewide parties and um, pro-independence parties, nationalist parties, etc. So um, in the graphs that we've just seen, um, we saw that there was a, a rapid rise in pro-independence sentiment in Catalonia from around 2010 onwards, but particularly from 2012 onwards. And I'm particularly interested in looking at what ways political, political competition at both Catalan level and Spanish level have contributed to that. Um, uh, that my fellow panellists were saying before that largely that rise was unexpected but I think actually if we look at the behaviour of Convergencia, your traditional mainstream nationalist party um, in Catalonia, there were signs before that that was going to happen. Um, 
a lot have interpreted Artur Mas's stance when he shifted towards a pro-sovereignty agenda ahead of the 2012 regional elections in Catalonia as being political expediency <coughs> due, to the, due to the rise of a grassroots movement. But actually, the party had started talking about uh, the need for a national transition back in 2006-2007. The party was already shifting in that direction back then. So really, if we want to understand why Convergencia shifted to a pro-sovereignty agenda from 2012, we need to look at why they started going in that direction from 2006-2007. Um, and I would say that from that stage, there were really two factors. One was there was genuine conviction within certain sectors of the party that the state of autonomy, Spain's decentralization model, had reached its limits. And there were a number of very valid reasons for that. But then on the other hand, there were also factors to do with political competition. Convergencia was in an increasingly difficult political climate in Catalonia, an increasingly competitive political climate, and it therefore needed to adjust. So there were the two factors, genuine conviction that the state of autonomies had reached its limits, but also an increasingly difficult political climate that meant that Convergencia needed to find a way to make sure it would continue to be the dominant party within Catalonia. So if we think about those two factors, first, genuine conviction within sectors of the party that the state of autonomies was reaching its limits. Why, had that, why was that happening? And really, we can see that from the late 1990s, there was actually a growing sense across a number of parties in Catalonia, not just the nationalist parties, also statewide parties, the socialists and the conservatives as represented in Catalonia. They were also fed up with lack of sufficient infrastructure in Catalonia, with the way the regional financing system was treating Catalonia. There was actually a cross-party concern um, within Catalonia in the late 1990s about these issues. And actually, ironically at the time, Convergencia was not the party that started to push most on these issues. It was still in accommodationist mode. Um, you know, if we think back to um, early 2000s, um, uh, Convergencia and the Catalan Parliament was still dependent on the Spanish Conservatives for support. It was still trying to, to, to find ways to work with Madrid when other actors within Catalonia, um, most notably the Republican left of Catalonia, but also the Catalan socialists, were starting to push more for a new regional autonomy statute that would address things like the, the lack of sufficient funding for Catalonia under the way the regional financing system works. And so why did Convergencia then start moving more towards addressing that, those issues as well? Well, I think really a key turning point, and when I've interviewed uh, members of Convergencia, I mean, obviously it's changed name now, but I'm talking about Convergencia because I'm talking back, back then. Um, a lot of them uh, have mentioned the fact that, you know, that absolute majority uh, PP conservative government uh, from 2000 to 2004 was a real turning point for a number of them. But at the same time, there was issue that new sectors, new generations were coming through in the party. There was a generational shift taking place. Um, we had sectors of the party's youth organisation coming through, as well as sectors, um, representatives of the Catalan National Federation of Students, students working their ways through the party. And those sectors had always been more pro-sovereignty, more pro-independence oriented compared to your more traditional members of Convergencia. And if we think, for example, okay, mass for Arthur of Mass to turn to a pro-sovereignty stance might have seemed quite surprising. But if we look at someone like his successor, Puigdemont, um, Puigdemont had never been a party heavyweight within Convergencia, but he had been heavily involved from the 80s within the, the, the youth movement of the party, which had always been more pro-sovereignty orientated and against um, the traditional alliances between Convergencia and the Conservatives. So I think all these factors help to explain why, when Artur Mas, um, from around 2006 to 2007, um, started to move the party more towards a pro-sovereignty stance, wanted to lead a sort of a movement towards a, um, a national transition, there, were ge there was genuine conviction within the party that, that this was needed, that the state of autonomies was coming to an end. So that's on the one hand, but on the other hand, there was also obviously an increasingly competitive political com climate, and that also contributed to the direction that the party went in. From the late 1990s, I mean, Convergencia lost its absolute majority in the Catalan Parliament. I think it was 95 it's lost its absolute majority and it's never had one since. Um, from then on, it had a relative majority. Um, it was facing increasing competition from the Republican left of Catalonia and also from the Catalan socialists, um, who, especially in the late 1990s, they were moving very, very much towards more of a Catalanist agenda, supporting some of the same ideas as the more nationalist parties. 
And this was an increasingly difficult climate for Convergencia to, to operate in. And it has led, we have seen from then onwards really, from the early 2000s onwards, that what developed was effectively a form of outbidding competition, as, as it's been called, between Convergencia and particularly uh, the Republican left of Catalonia, mainly between those two parties. And of course Convergencia was in a very difficult position when it ended up in opposition due to coalition politics at the time when the new statute of autonomy mm -hmm. was drawn up. And from then on, we have seen this, this competitive dynamic between Convergencia and Esquerra um, in particular, which has made it very difficult for either one of them to perhaps take a st step back, even if you know, the, there might be shifting priorities at different times. It's been very difficult for either of them to do so. Um, and really, that mixture of conviction combined with an increasingly competitive environment politically has, has continued in recent years in the wake of the aftermath um, of the financial crisis. I mean, obviously, on the one hand, you had, for example, Convergencia being tainted by its implication in, um, in corruption scandals. All of that sort of issue contributed to the party needing to develop a new project and pushed it further towards a pro-sovereignty agenda. But at the same time, you had an absolute majority conservative government in Madrid, which was attempting to re-centralize. For example, a lot of the, fiscal, um, the burden of fiscal adjustment in the wake of the financial crisis was placed on the regions. They had a harder task than the central government did. And so that also gave more reasons for a conviction within sectors of the party that a new relationship with Spain was needed. So really, we've seen that mix of the two factors ever since, both conviction within sectors of the party that that, um, that the state of autonomy is, is no longer working, but also um, the need for um, strategizing in an increasingly competitive an environment. And obviously, I've only just touched there on um, uh, behavior at Catalan regional level in terms of political competition. We've also obviously seen at Spanish national level the way parties have often behaved has also contributed to the rise of a pro-independence movement. I mean, I've looked particularly a lot at uh, regional financing and how that works in Spain and looking at different periods of negotiation when, when frequently, you know, the, both the socialists and the conservatives, um, their interests lie predominantly in other regions, which therefore means that they look out primarily for those regions. So that sort of dynamic hasn't helped obviously, to, to finding an accommodation for Catalonia within Spain. So there's different issues going on, but basically all I wanted to do here was, was to draw attention to, 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 because I think it's often presented the Catalan situation is, you know, some people see it in a black and white way as a grassroots movement that's pushed the politicians to react. Others see it as, as an entirely elite-induced movement whereby the parties have shaped the way citizens think about things. I think really there's a, it, it's, it's somewhere in between. There have been a mix of factors going on and it's not a black and white scenario as to what has led to the rise in the pro-independence movement. Thank you. I hope I didn't go over my <laughs> table. <laughs> So now we're going to go to Jeffrey Milo, Miley, 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 yeah. <laughs> who's a lecturer in political sociology, Cambridge, and the co-author of Conflict in Catalonia: A Sociological Approximation. So. I'm going to be very interested to hear. Yes, your thank analysis. you. Yeah, thank you for having me here um, to speak about uh, this question. This is, I've been talking about Catalan politics, Spanish politics, and Catalan politics for uh, longer than I would have liked to. Uh, I wrote my dissertation back in the late 90s, uh, uh, graduated uh, in 2004. Uh, so I did my field work in the late 90s when people used to ask, well, why are you, why are you talking about Catalonia? There's no problem there. <laughs> um, so, but since then, I, I, I've been trying to expand it to, to work on self-determination movements and comparative perspective, but the Catalan question keeps drawing me back. So anyhow, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, the, this, the struggle for self-determination, I think this is a really important issue, that what's going on in Catalonia has to do with a struggle for self-determination. And self-determination is a tricky thing for democratic theory. 
because uh, as Sir Ivor Jennings uh, put it a lot long ago, it's easy to say, we'll let the people decide, but we have to decide who the people are. And so uh, from the standpoint of democratic theory, unless you take a p position that nations are somehow given and each nation somehow has a natural right to self-determination, uh, if, if we throw up what the nation is as a question, it becomes very difficult to deal with, actually. So let's try to get a couple of, a few approximations about the, the thorniness of this problem. Uh, on the one hand, uh, if we talk about the, the struggle for self-determination in Catalonia, one thing which is true, uh, which is when we start looking at the, as a kind of democratic problem, is in Catalonia, there is a supermajority, a supermajority in favor of the idea that whatever you think, yes or no independence, that Catalonia has a right to decide that question unilaterally. That the, that the question that, that it's up to Catalans to decide whether or not Catalonia should be independent or not, and a lot of the conflict has to do with the, the way in which the Spanish Constitution doesn't allow for that possibility. So there's this supermajority in Catalan society. It's been asked a few times. Uh, it hasn't been asked enough. It would be interesting if, if we could get this asked more frequently in surveys. Uh, but the, C the Centro de Investigaciones Sociológicas stays away from it, and so does the Catalan uh, uh, polling. Uh, mo most, for most of the time, stays away from it. But when it's been asked, it's been clear that there is a supermajority in favor of this. Uh, and it's also clear that at the level of Spain, there's a supermajority that's opposed to this. Okay, uh, and the thing is that the Constitution uh, so, sort of reflects the will of the Spanish majority and doesn't reflect the will of the Catalan majority on this question. So that's the first issue. Uh, so there's a supermajority in favor of a right to self-determination within Catalonia, even though, as we see, when we push it, when we look at the, the, uh, how many people are actually in favor of independence, it goes down. Uh, so let's get to the second point, that Catalan society, and this is something that I think uh, uh, our, our, our uh, colleagues here, uh, Tovenia and Satorra, have been quite uh, convincing on, Catalan society is quite divided over the question of independence. Uh, there is no clear majority in Catalonia, uh, either one way or the other. So uh, some, of the, some of the data here shows that it looks like it's around 40%, but that's looking at the, the survey of the overall population. If there were a referendum, it would actually perhaps be very close because, uh, the, because uh, those who are in favor of Catalan uh, self-determination and Catalan independence are highly mobilized. Uh, and there have been moments at which the uh, anti-independence uh, 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 faction of Catalan society have mobilized. In particular, there was, in the run-up to the referendum, uh, there was a very impressive uh, mass demonstration, though a lot of people came from the rest of Spain. Uh, but in general, the, uh, uh, the Catalan independent side is more mobilized. And so in a referendum, it would have very much to do with the dynamics of who gets the vote out, and it's unclear what would happen. Uh, it's unclear what would happen, uh, but it's, it seems clear that there wouldn't be a clear majority either way. So it's a relatively divided society. But then the question is, uh, and as, as, the, as the partisans of Catalan independence quickly point out, let us, let us, let, let us see. And the, and the Spanish Constitution doesn't allow for that possibility. So uh, let me just say a few more things about the, uh, uh, to add a few more things about the nature of uh, opinions in Catalonia. Uh, when we look at this, so I, I would have to dissent a little bit from, although you guys said some things uh, uh, which, which are undeniable about the nature of the divide, I would, I would dissent uh, uh, from the idea that Catalonia is a divided society. Because the two polls that you're looking at, there's one poll which feels only Catalan, uh, and then there's another poll that feels Spanish and Catalan. So there's very few people actually feel only Spanish. Uh, and this actually is also reflected when you look at the question, uh, uh, when you look at the question of how intensely do you prefer whatever your preference is? How intensely do you prefer independence? Or how, do you prefer not being independent? And what you see is there's an, as there's an asymmetry between the side which is highly mobilized in favor of independence, which feels very intensely in favor of independence. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a survey from 2016 where amongst those who were in favor of independence, a supermajority of those in favor of independence felt on a scale of 1 to 10, between 9 and 10 on how, how intensely they preferred independence. Whereas when we asked people who, who, who preferred staying in Spain, how much did they care about it, a lot of them didn't care that much about it. So you have uh, a, a, a very big difference between, let's say, it may be that a majority of the population is uh, against independence, but there is an intense minority 
which is close to a majority and could be mobilizably a, a majority, which feels very, very, very fervently in favor of independence. And this, again, is a question from democratic theory, which is an interesting question, which is how to deal with the preference intensity. So if it's true that 40%, if we, uh, 40 of the population is in favor of independence and 60% of the population is against independence, but that that 40% that's in favor of independence thinks that this is the most important thing in the world, it's not clear our intuition about what democracy says. Should an intense minority, should their preferences be uh, 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 catered to more than a more lackadaisical, less intense majority? So I think this is a question, but by all means, uh, the issue, uh, 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 the, the issue uh, is uh, not decided. Is is is, is uh, the rules of the game are stacked against those people who fa who favor intensely independence because the Spanish Constitution doesn't allow for a referendum to take place. Um, so that's uh, uh, with respect to this question of preference intensity. And so what the Spanish Constitution and what the, the people on the side of the Spanish Constitution have gone for uh, as the mobilization has occurred is they've gone for a, a strategy of responding to this mobilization with rather than accommodating this democratic demand, which is, a, which is at the level of Catalonia, again and again they win electoral majorities, so democratically elected uh, majorities at the level of Catalonia, the, the strategy of the, Spanish, of, the, of the Spanish authorities has been to repress rather than try to accommodate this demand. And so there's a question also from democratic theory, which is how much if you have uh, uh, at the regional level, you have again and again democratic majorities coming up in favor of something that is not uh, uh, fitting inside of the constitution, do we need a new constitution or do we repress? And so far, the Spanish authorities have gone for uh, what I would call a rigid understanding of the rule of law, which says we repress this and we put democratically elected uh, politicians in jail for breaking the law. So here we come up to a question which is, we can think of it as democracy versus the rule of law, uh, where uh, the rule of law is imposing over democracy, or we could think of it as, but uh, it's a little bit more difficult than this, it's perhaps it's a majoritarian understanding of democracy, where the will of the Spanish majority imposes itself over the will of the Catalan majority or the Catalan intense, intensely prefer, the intense minority. Uh, and uh, I think that there's questions with respect to how long you can, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, try to govern uh, through, uh, in a democratic context through repression alone. And I think that's part of the, uh, uh, part of the question that we have here. Uh, and what could be, because as well, and this is what I, I'm most concerned about with respect to the dynamic, on the one hand, there's been there's been interesting uh, there's been a dynamic of polarization that has taken place. Even if it's the even if I don't agree that we can say that Catalan society is deeply divided, I do think there's definitely been a dynamic of polarization. And two interesting things have happened. One thing is uh, in the Catalan nationalist camp. The Catalan nationalist camp has uh, has evolved from something which was a kind of cons Christian Democrat, relatively conservative, pujolista kind of uh, uh, convergencia, to now we have very revolutionary kind of uh, uh, Comité de Defensa de la República in the street. Huh? And we've seen as well with uh, Esquerra Republicana taking up much force. So there's been a kind of leftward turn in Catalan nationalism, uh, but it's a leftward turn that comes up against some of the demographic issues that were spent, that were dealt with, particularly uh, a leftward turn that comes up against a difficulty kind of uh, uh, appealing to, in particular, people from Spanish-speaking working-class backgrounds uh, in the metropolitan uh, uh, region of Barcelona. So it's a leftward turn, but nonetheless with a particular demographic difficulty. But and that's le that's not uh, uh, for me. I'm a left-wing guy. I, I kind of think that it's a, it's a lot easier to defend Catalan nationalism as it turns to the left than when it was Pujolista. But on the other hand, what you've seen in Spain is we've moved from 15M indignados to the rise of Volks. And the rise of Volks, I think, is only understandable as a reaction to the dynamics in Catalonia. And that is something that is very disturbing to me. Uh, and that's a kind of, when we talk about fanaticism, uh, I, I think that the clearly the most obvious uh, 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 culprits of fanaticism are the people, these people that uh, are uh, uh, basically arguing for a resurgence of Spanish fascism. 
which we de which we clearly see with Volks, which would be which is part and parcel of the dynamics of polarization and part and parcel of uh, not only the dynamics of polarization, it also has to do with the uh, uh, delegitimation of the establishment par parties through corruption that is revealed in the context of austerity politics. So uh, on the one hand, you see Pujolismo goes down and you see a kind of uh, intensification of uh, a kind of street politics in Catalonia, uh, which, uh, which, which uh, veers to the left with some difficulties. But in Spain, you really see a, a, a surging Spanish nationalism veering to the far right. And that's very, that's very dangerous. And with respect to where we're at, we're at a stalemate, really. We're at a stalemate where, on the one hand, uh, as I say, the, uh, this kind of left-wing turn in Catalan nationalism can't get a supermajority in favor of independence precisely because it comes up against, against this thorny difficulty, which is where I have to give you guys, I say you guys are really on to something, which is the difficulty of the Catalan nationalist movement uh, appealing to, in particular, uh, the metropolitan region of Barcelona, that, work, that, that working class Spanish speaking uh, uh, area. Uh, and if you could, see, if there was a way which they could appeal to those people, then you could see a supermajority emerging in favor of something like this left wing Catalan nationalist agenda, but they come up against Spanish nationalists nationalism in Catalonia. Uh, Spanish nationalism in Catalonia. If you look at, for example, the electoral results in the metropolitan area of Barcelona, you see that, in fact, some of these right-wing Spanish forces uh, are much more popular than, uh, let's say, La Coupe. The, the, the coup is. So, um, that's, so that's the failure of Catalan nationalism and, it, and, and, and its a, a ability to push for a supermajority in favor of this kind of left-wing independence agenda. But on the other hand, uh, you have a failure of Spanish nationalism because Spain has a real difficult time governing itself right now. And this has to do with some of the, uh, some of the dynamics that Carolyn, I think, was talking about, about the ways in which, uh, uh, for a long time in the 1990s and into the 2000s, in order to govern in Spain, you needed to have, uh, uh, you needed to have support of, of the Catalan, of the Catalan speaking middle classes that, that supported Convergencia, which are now have very much intensified. And that makes it very difficult to govern Spain because this is a sociological base, a very important sociological base for the stability of the post transition democracy at the level of Spain was some kind of accommodation of the Catalan middle classes. And the Catalan middle classes are, are being repressed right now rather than being accommodated. And that makes it very difficult to govern uh, Spain in a, in a democratic fashion. Let me just say uh, a couple of things. I think this also speaks again, I'll, and I'll just, I'll, fin I'll finish with two points. This speaks again to, uh, the, to put it in a comparative perspective. This is a, another manifestation of the ways in which the center uh, uh, and establishment politics have been delegitimated uh, in this period of, uh, of austerity politics in the, in the, in the post-Eurozone crisis in Europe. Uh, and so uh, both the developments in Catalan nationalism and the developments in Spanish nationalism, I think, speak to that. But I think, crucially, uh, what we come to is, uh, and I will appeal to the spirit of the Constitution, we come to a, a, a real problem from the standpoint of democratic politics. And here's where I think the spirit of the Constitution uh, comes up against, uh, uh, up against uh, the letter of the Constitution. So the letter of the Constitution uh, says no referendum. But the spirit of the Constitution, if we go back to the time of the transition, was this idea that we have to try to accommodate. We can't just repress. And so at this point, I think that there is a real disjuncture between the spirit and the letter of the law. And I think the spirit of the Constitution needs to, uh, 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 needs to reign in the end if we're going to have democratic governance in Spain. Uh, and I will just uh, refer uh, my Spanish nationalist friends to the Canadian precedent uh, for thinking, thinking through things in a more democratic way. Thank you. <clears throat> well, hi everybody, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it is really a great pleasure to, to be able to share and discuss this uh, with you guys. Uh, well, in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to be talking about... <laughs> I honestly try to be brief, also being the last one, people, I, I would like to hear what everybody has to say. Uh, but in any case, I just wanted to highlight a couple of issues. Uh, the first one is, who are these secessionist voters, really? I think that this is the very first step uh, in order to understand the motives, the incentives, uh, in order to really sort of like discuss the second aspect of the presentation, which are 
you know, which are the different viable ways forward. Yeah? So essentially, I will just start off with some very, very basic descriptive statistics, really, that complement many of the things that have been said, but perhaps provide sort of like a, a slightly broader sort of like a, a portrait of these canonical secessionist voter using the second wave of the annual 2019 public opinion barometer from the same source that, that, that my colleagues have been, have, been using, have been using before. So we have spoken relatively little about education, and I think that, well, surprise, surprise, in terms of uh, public opinion, education is actually one of the biggest drivers, mm -hmm. one of the biggest predictors uh, uh, sort of like uh, of secession, and sometimes in a way that it's perhaps not that intuitive, at least for the for our international audience uh, uh, today. So here you just see very simple descriptive statistics here, looking at the percentage of support for independence uh, across the different educational categories, and you clearly see a linear monotonic pattern that is actually quite well known these days, uh, where secondary school and higher levels, so university degrees, tend to be overrepresented. These, these categories tend to sort of like support independence uh, beyond the 50% threshold. A different interesting aspect that I wanted to discuss that, to be honest, was surprising to me the first time that I was just sort of like looking at this, was age, right? I was also expecting a sort of more bimodal sort of like thing, but it's actually much more cross-cutting than what you would sort of sometimes expect uh, according to the narrative, yeah? So it is true that the most secessionist category is the youngest one, from 18 to 24 years old, and the least secessionist category is the oldest, beyond 64 years old, but it is also quite interesting to see this cross-cutting, very similar level across all these middle-aged categories right on the 50% threshold. Yeah? Uh, this is just a very simple descriptive statistic, but I think this has important implications for the schooling, uh, the, the role of the Catalan schooling aspect that was mentioned before. Yeah? It's a lot of talk about, uh, it's a very sensible hypothesis, like, well, to which extent after the restoration of democracy, uh, these new generations of sort of like children schooled only in Catalan, to which extent that changed their value system, their territorial preferences. Well, if that was, you know, true at face value, we should see a big gap, especially between the third and the fourth cohorts, but we don't. And we actually see that essentially this is actually quite cross-cutting. Then I would like to mention something about the relationship between support for independence and uh, household income measure uh, at, the, at, at the monthly level. Yeah? And, and, and I was very happy when my colleagues mentioned the Piketty sort of like uh, controversy, and, and, and this has also been a big debate in social media recently. Um, so you could argue that it's true that essentially there is a somewhat sort of like linear pattern according to which, right, higher levels of income sort of like tend to, be, tend to be a little bit more secessionist. And many people see here a war between the rich and the poor. Um, and of course, it's just a matter of interpretation and there's all sorts of ideological biases. I struggle to see a war between the, the, the rich and the poor here. I actually see quite a very obvious cross-cutting middle class support around the middle that actually the, increases a little bit around here. People that are significantly more well off 3,000 euro per month onwards, but then it decreases again, and then it picks up again, yeah? So once we disaggregate income sort of like categories as, as much as we can, that linearity of the income spectrum gets broken. So I'm not gonna deny that there is a linear relationship between income and support for secession, but it's actually much more cross-cutting and middle and middle upper class than what sometimes this is represented in the public, in the public debate. Much more importantly, I think, with all these income, class, occupational, the rich versus the poor, I actually think that it's very important to distinguish our individual level of analysis from the aggregate level of analysis. Yeah? So one thing is to say, you know, higher income people have a higher tendency to be secessionist. Yeah? Nothing against that. So if you go to Catalan society and you pick someone at random and you happen to pick someone very well off, I would put all my money, or I would try to guess, chances are this person is going to be secessionist. Fine. Does this mean that this movement is the movement of the rich? I don't think so, yeah? Because then what we need to look at is that the distribution is just simply the density function of how populated these categories are. How many people are there in uh, Catalan society earning more than 4,000 euro a month? Well, essentially nobody, yeah? So, <laughs> sure, sure, they are secessionists, but they are just so, such a small category. So this simply means that if you pick someone at random from society who's rich is gonna be secessionist, 
But if you go to one of these secessionist demonstrations on the 11th of September, you're not going to see a majority of rich people there. You're just going to see a majority of people from the most populated income categories. Even if individually each category is slightly less likely than the richer ones, they are just conforming the bulk of society. This is the so-called individualistic fallacy that we also make when describing Brexit in the aggregate, no? and, and so on and so forth. Anyways. Um, okay, so all this talk about the occupational income sort of like story made me think like, well, perhaps there's a bit of economic preference, ideological driver behind it, no? But because, of course, the demand for more fiscal federalism, control of regional finances, is such an important aspect in the elite, elite sort of like discourse uh, uh, in the secessionist movement. But then uh, I actually don't see much evidence that uh, economic preferences uh, truly correlate with support for secession. So essentially in this survey you see to which extent, so the level of agreement towards this item, uh, which is uh, to which extent government should not intervene in the economy, yeah? a very classical item in public opinion research to try to infer right wing or left wing economic kind of like preferences. And you see that you know, the level of secessionism uh, between agree, neutral and disagree is actually kind of the same. So there is not a big economic preference market versus redistribution divide here. There is a very strong divide when talking about social cultural issues. Yeah? The territorial dimension is increasingly overlapping with non-economic social cultural kind of attitudes towards issues. And uh, interestingly, and again, sometimes the, this is actually very well known, I think, and amongst people working with this data, but perhaps a bit more surprising for international analysts and, and people who do not follow the topic that well, uh, the, the liberal side is typically correlated with the secessionist side. Yeah? So here to the statement, gay couples should be able to adopt children like heterosexual couples. People very much agreeing or very strongly agreeing with this, meaning the liberal kind of like response to this, is the one that is actually above 50% of support for secession. And if you're a bit more neutral or, or a bit less into gay rights, you're actually not that secessionist. Uh, what happens with immigration attitudes? Yeah, this is actually my main line of research. I'm very interested in, in sort of like these anti-immigrant attitudes, radical right voting and stuff like this. Uh, agreement or disagreement towards basically this statement. With so much immigration, one doesn't feel like at home anymore. Yeah? So people who disagree or strongly disagree with this statement, so the pro-immigration kind of like bunch in Catalan society, is also supporting the 50, you know, secession above the 50% threshold and the relationship is strong and monotonic and it resists the typical controls in multivariate analysis and, and so on and so forth, right? So this, I think, is some element. This doesn't prove nor disprove anything. This is just a, dis a descriptive analysis, but that puts into question the ethnocultural interpretation, I think, of the, of the, of the movement that has been given before, yeah? So this is a pro-immigration, socially liberal, nationalistic movement. And I understand that the two things are like, what <laughs> is going on, right? Uh, it, is actually not, it is actually not so obvious. So this is what I call, this is what I mean, I call maybe some people call the secessionist paradox. Yeah? This is a nationalistic movement. It is indeed a uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, upbringing, language, identity, as my colleagues uh, showed before, I mean, matter a lot. I mean, this is a territorial center periphery conflict. How, how would they not? Uh, but it's a bit more nuanced than that, yeah? So I think that uh, uh, this is a liberal nationalist movement. And the secessionist paradox is essentially basically this. Why then? The winners of the status quo, we're talking about the highly educated, we're, we're talking about the middle and the middle upper classes, we're talking about people who do not fear globalization, who like it, they like immigration. Why then they want to secede? Yeah? This is a bit the paradox that is food for thought uh, for the discussion. If you ask these people, and I'm aware that this is very controversial, yeah? but if you ask, of course, this group, they're going to talk, I'm surprised we haven't spoken too much about it before. But essentially, the plan A of these people, I think, it was never secession, not in the last decade. We really need to understand what happened in the 2010s. Yeah? I think, and actually Caroline, I think, explained that very well, the evolution of the preferences. I think the plan A of these people was to change the constitutional reconfiguration of the state, to have more control of the taxes, to have more recognition in terms of national, cultural, whatever. Um, and then they actually put all the eggs in the basket in the 2010s with the Catalan Statute of Autonomy that has been perceived by this group, and I'm aware that many people will, will disagree and, and some others will agree, but this has been uh, perceived as a complete failure, as the proof that federalism 
that the middle of the road is not possible in Spain. Yeah? Because once again, we're talking about the status quo people, we're talking about the highly educated, we're not talking about the revolutionary container burning uh, sort of like uh, type. Yeah? We're talking about very status quo type. And this is why the Catalan movement, I think, was never explicitly secessionist. The interpretation then of the, of the failure of the federal route in the best possible conditions with a friendly left-wing government that theoretically was claiming to be federal and with the secessionists in Catalonia supporting a left-wing coalition rather than supporting a nationalistic front with a traditional Convergencia Union center-right. So the classical secession is supporting a federal center-left agenda with you know, the socialist government in Spain. That didn't come to fruition, they say, then what else? There's absolutely no chance. This is at least the interpretation, right? Um, so how come these guys who have so much to lose from a change in the status quo still support secession? Because they don't see any clear alternative from the state that is better uh, than that, yeah? So the costs of secession are still lower than the costs of the status quo. Kind of crazy. They don't perceive any sort of like anything in the last decade, anything that was seemingly attractive. There's also a macro level argument, I'm, I'm, I'm towards the end now. There's a, there's a macro level argument that applies to Catalonia, but, but, not, but not only, right? There's a bit of an interesting sort of like deepening of regional divides precisely in an era of globalization. Some people find this puzzling, yeah? They say, hey, we're more connected than ever. We're more open than ever. We trade with everybody. Uh, why this retrenchment towards regional sort of like divides? Well, precisely because globalization now has gone so far away. From a political economic perspective, national markets are less meaningful. Yeah? You don't have to trade within your national state anymore. As a firm in Barcelona, you trade with Switzerland, you trade with the UK, you trade with China. In order to get military security, you don't need the national boundaries anymore. No? So precisely globalization has deepened socioeconomic, political inequalities across regions. And the secessionist movement, I believe, sees this as an opportunity. They say, oh, that lowers the cost of secession because now we have a global, supranational European thing. We don't need the national market anymore to survive. We can, we can do it on our own. So this is not the same as populist anti-immigrant movements. This is the mirror image of this. These guys like globalization and they want a seat on, on the globalization game. They want to they be part of it. Okay, last slide, really. Uh, three ways. Having tried to understand a bit who these guys are and some of the issues in their narrative and some of the issues in their ideological kind of like orientation, there's, there's three ways forward and then we need to discuss and maybe in the Q&A people have better ideas. My, my, my conclusion is going to be not very enlightening and very pessimistic. <laughs> uh, but there's th three logical ways forward. The first one is considering this uh, under the lenses of criminal law, which is exactly what Jeffrey was explaining. Yeah? Uh, the, the, some people would say repressive, some people would say sort of like the legal action. Like, guys, this is an anomalous preference. This preference is actually not quite legal slash constitutional slash legitimate. It was a crime according to our law. We are a democracy, therefore let's apply the law. This is a bit what's happening. This is the only response currently happening. Many people love it and many people do not love it. Then, what am I going to say? Well. Uh, you know, at the very least, you can say that even if you love this uh, approach, it is normatively disputed. Yeah, it is not as clear cut as you know some people want to claim. Why is that? Because while it is true that international sort of like elites and countries have been quite silent and quite sort of like uh, light touch on the issue, which has been a blow for the secessionist strategy. You know, they feel a bit of a cold shoulder from the EU and all that. But when push came to shove, you know, reveal preferences in behavioral economic terms, whenever judiciary bodies at the international level had to really act in terms of implementing European warrants of arrest or extraditing people, they just didn't do it. And I feel that the data points are too big now to brush them under the carpet. I feel that this is actually quite telling that neither Germany, nor the UK, nor Switzerland, nor Belgium have been playing ball with the Spanish state when requested to do so. I think this cannot be brushed under the carpet. This is too big for this to be the only strategy. Not to speak about uh, Amnesty International, United Nations, detention, arbitrary detention group. Anyways, let's assume for a second, and then I'm finishing, 
that uh, <laughs> let's assume for a second it was on 45 minutes but almost uh, <laughs> so let's uh, let's assume for a second that this is normatively all right yeah let's assume for a second that it, this is legally speaking by the textbook well now I'm wearing my political science hat which I'm a bit I feel more comfortable wearing because I'm not an expert in criminal law at all it's just simply not effective. Yeah? Vox is unleashed, legitimized, the conflict is at its peak. So at least from a public policy perspective, we need to be honest and move on. Federal <laughs> RAF, it failed in the, in the 2010s. This is a natural thing that every good-minded, good well-meaning, well-hearted person says, why not we sit down and talk? Well, that's what we did the last decade, and this is why we moved on from that. Low popular support in Spain, tremendous electoral costs, especially for the left. We can talk about this uh, again. And then the referendum of self-determination. I was very happy that Jeffrey was sort of like highlighting the pros, the cons, challenges with democratic theory. I think that's the core of the debate. Very tricky. On the one hand, there is a super majority. Uh, Professor Satoro was surprised about those crazy graphs that he was showing. Absolutely true. Uh, I was very surprised about this one. This is very difficult to see support for a given option in, uh, in a socially fragmented society. 75% of people in Catalan society would support a referendum for self-determination. Uh, this is very rare to see in this era of social fragmentation, unstable governments, polarization. There is a super majority for something. The question is whether this song will like this something and whether it is feasible. And the last slide, and, this, and I really mean this, uh, this is the only cross-identity coalition, because I agree with my colleagues at the very beginning in the presentation that we need to, you know, these intermediate identities are crucial. Yeah? Uh, this is the only solution that involves that intermediate identity. So if you look at support for a referendum across different identity levels, uh, you reach beyond 50% also for those people that feel as a Spanish as Catalan, and of course, as it would be more expected, more Catalan than Spanish, and only Catalan. That is the only cross-identity coalition incorporating this middle category, which is indeed the modal category where most people are located. Apologize for missing the time, but thank you very much. <laughs> immediately because I'll open the discussion. I mean, one thought is, and it relates to the referendum, what on earth does sovereignty mean nowadays? Mm. You know, and it's the same with Brexit. You know, I go around canvassing, and Brexit's a kind of magic bullet, but nobody actually knows what it means in this interdependent world. You know, we used to think a state meant an army, a currency, um, well, we know it means a flag. <laughs> but what does it mean? It means choosing, you're so embedded in the world, it just means choosing, you know, whether you emphasize, I don't know, France or Spain, in the Brexit case, it's the US or, you know, mm. I just don't know, and nobody knows what it means. So having a referendum, and which is our experience, the problem is nobody knows what they're voting for, actually. And, but it creates a kind of deep ideological commitment to something that people think needs change, but they don't know what it means. So my question is, what the hell is sovereignty in a globalized era? That's one question. And um, the second question is, I mean, it's so evident that there's some deep link to austerity mm. and the austerity context. Uh, it's just that you see it everywhere. And, you know, one can discuss what, the, I mean, you're the only person who really mentioned it, but one can discuss what the connections are with austerity. But it also occurs to me, you know, isn't this where the left 
ought to be talking about opposing austerity as a solution to these problems and mm -hmm. these issues. And, you know, are they missing a trick on all of that? And maybe if socialists get together with the Demos, that might make a difference. I don't know. But those were my two thoughts. Well, actually, I had another one about gender, but I won't go into that. <laughs> 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 Uh, but let me open for other people to discuss, and then I'm going to hand over to Jose. Yes. <coughs> yes, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I visited uh, Barcelona seven years ago. It really, I mean, that is the most beautiful city. Not one of the most beautiful cities, the most beautiful city. I think that <coughs> one reason for that is the only people sit in the city I have ever visited. I'm not really you know that and the road is different from other cities that the the past of people walking in the city in the center. Yes. My question is that is it that they're so beautiful they don't like to be part of Spain? Or in other words, <laughs> what's the root cause of the in, of the fact that they like to be independent? Thank you. Mm. And Jose? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Thank you very much for, for all the presentation. I found it very interesting. I have a couple of questions. First for Jeff. Um, because there's, there are two things he mentioned that are surprising a little bit. So you do mention that the, the independence movement moved to, towards the left. And uh, nominally it did move towards the left. But uh, from the point of view of um, the discourse they were holding, there's not a clear move towards the left in the sense that, for example, Esquerra Republicana adopted in that time the discourse of uh, Spain rock from us, and when they were in government, they were not, they were actually quite harsh with austerity as well. So, uh, and also, if you see, I mean, uh, Sergi was very convinced in, in, in showing that the, probably the socioeconomic divide is not the most definitory one, probably still the ethno-linguistic could be more predictable. But still, you see that the, it's not the working classes, the, those that are kind of uh, opposing that, and those that may feel the, the situation more vulnerable vis a vis uh, an eventual change. So if you are working class and there's a dramatic change, it may all go better, I mean, to, for the best, uh, but if you, they, are, they, are, they have less of a safety net that the elites or the middle classes which could uh, deal with this issue there. So that's why. First thing I was thinking, to what extent do you think this is, goes beyond the nomina, right? And, 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 into, and the second thing is about, uh, it links a little bit with the, who you mentioned, Sergi, and, and you as well, I think, implicit in terms of uh, federalism. So I think that the idea of federalism has been ruled out very quickly. Um, it's true that they kind of discuss it, but at the time when it, it was the moment, it was 2010, 2011, it was after the moment of austerity. And it was never presented as a real federal state. What it was presented was more as a confederation. So let's, let's try to have a situation in which uh, different parts of Spain have different statuses and they have different, uh, they have the ability even to, to because in, in, the, in the referendum, in, sorry, in the statute of autonomy, it was a bit more towards confederalism than the federalism. So, and my, my fear is also that the, a lot of the people in the national nationalist camp, they're not com comfortable with uh, federalism. So that's why also it was never a very credible promise because uh, the left couldn't get even the support of the, of the nationalists in that sense. I don't think the, the, uh, a federal system like the German one or something like that would have been accepted in, in Catalonia, or at least by the nationalists either. So these are the two things I wanted to do. So I'll, I'll let you know. Well, I'm not going to answer him. Oh, okay. No, no. Should we collect and more questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay, whatever well, you like. I, I wanted to thank, <laughs> just thank, uh, three comments that the different speakers have done. Oh, yeah. If you, um, if you give me permission. I'll give you permission. Okay. And then I'll give Adam so, permission. Uh, as okay. long as you don't take. No, no. Okay. okay. I wanted to thank Carolina first because he introduced the competition between, between parties. Yeah. And so the other side of the grassroots. I wanted to thank uh, Professor Miley 
because he reminded to everybody that another president of Catalan Secession is what was, has been Vox, the uh, renaissance of right wing in Spain, uh, a phenomenon that we didn't uh, have for almost 50 years. Uh, and I also wanted to thank Sergio because he reminded everybody that uh, this is a movement of educated middle classes, essentially. That, in my view, because they never ask them if they want to sell a referendum of self-determination. That's not the, the element of the, of the question. They always ask, do you want to decide the future of Catalonia? And in, inside this, you can put for your question all kinds of elements and ingredients I mean, I'm not just, to show. just on that last, just on that last point, that's why I, I, I included an appeal that people are interested in doing surveys. That this is a, that, that's a, a, the finding that Sergi put put up is a really important finding, and there's not and they don't ask it enough, and they don't ask it in enough ways. Uh, you don't see it near, you don't see it enough in, in the survey. Exactly. Yeah, it's a crucial one. The one, exactly. I, the one I showed you is pretty recent and it's available for everyone. Mm. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. the first one. It's the first time. It's the first time. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm it's the first time. I'm allowed to now. Our one. It's okay, I can speak for the other. It's just a very short question. I'm yeah, struggling. I'm uh, usually I'm not political scientist, I'm a statistician. I'm just struggling with the data and you know, all these massive amount of data. And uh, my feeling and I'm, uh, is that there is very difficult to find something. There is a service which has many questions, and even they have many questions, people get confused. For example, I think it's false, completely false, that the majority, there is a super majority that wants a referendum. It's false because it's the way it's being asked. Check the questions. Check what they, how they ask. Because there is the, two, the, the, the issue of whether it is a referendum with uh, uh, with approval from Madrid or, or is a referendum without any conditions. So my issue is that I'm not a political scientist, and I think there is a lot of work to work. We are designing this. The software. We ask the question. We ask the question. Regardless of what you think. Regardless of what you think on the question of independence, do you think that the decision should belong to the Catalan people alone or to all of Spain? That's the question we asked. And we got a supermajority in favor of the Catalan people yeah. alone. I have a follow-up. That was 2016. 2016. Yeah. 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 But, but why there is yeah. no... You see, the, the, I, I have my, my, my reservation, say, on the way the question the questionnaire is made. I used several questions on that, on that survey, but the, this, this, that there is a super majority. And for me, I do understand. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I do understand. That. No, you finish your question. No, I, 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 I'm almost also skeptical on, on how these things are being I, I too, was skeptical. I, 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 I got in front of the Pompeo Fabra. I got in the Pompeo Fabra. I said, I don't believe it. I said it in front of 200 people. I don't believe it. I asked it myself. And I got what I got, and so I've come, I've come around the Sergi's position by looking at the data. And the that's why that I say, ask it more. This supermajority comes from two different types of people. The people who won the referendum, who are really dreaming of it every day, and people who are not their first preference, but they are okay with it. Yeah. That's why. That's right. That's why you get this supermajority. <coughs> and that's why once you disaggregate it into what you say, that's why suddenly the things are, get a bit more wobbly. So that supermajority is first and second preferences for a referendum, I think. Okay, yeah. So I'm going to hand over Don't to Jose. Don't let me call her. Yeah. a chair. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, That's a good no, question. I agree. I agree. But the issue is that it's having said that what does it mean about it for independence? Then it means that then now we make it even more difficult. What does it mean? The question of whether a referendum or the new one Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before you leave, before you leave, before you leave, yes, austerity has a lot to do with the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we must continue. I tell you what.
continue talking about it and yeah. I'll get Jose to report. <laughs> <laughs> Both on austerity right. and sovereignty. Yeah. Um, you asked me if we, you, should yeah. I answer your question? Yeah. 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 Shall we put them yeah. all from the audience? Yeah, we can put them all from the audience if you want. Yeah. Okay. Tony? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you everyone for a fantastic uh, presentation for the different views. I, I have a question that um, it's uh, probably is, is, is for Jeff because uh, I know that uh, I've read your paper with great interest, and I know that you, you emphasize that the fact that when you have this, is not a symmetrical polarization, but uh, um, a nationalist camp which have high intensity preference, or show quite uh, you know, an intense preference for for the, for the views, and, and another half that what well, we we can simplify is it has a lower intensity. Um, how that is possible when ten years ago there was no such a High intensity for any of the preferences today that uh, that are, are the source of this uh, bitterness in Catalonia. What happened to that that half that was the, uh, that preference so intensely to, to feel it intensely? And uh, um, is anything beyond beyond the economic crisis uh, going backwards? Is any factor that has to do with that? I mean. Uh, just not simply austerity, but I know that you mentioned austerity and probably uh, it's an important role, but is there anything else apart from austerity yeah. that dates back to to the 80s, 90s, and 2000s? Yeah. Um, so, oh, shall we collect one more? Yeah. And, and then. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> back there, no? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just want to uh, put to the, the speakers uh, the idea seems quite assumed by your. Uh, that uh, the Spanish Constitution actually forbids a referendum on independence. I'm not a legal expert, but I don't think there is any active uh, uh, denial of such. I think it's more like the opinion of a highly politicized constitutional mm -hmm. court. Maybe can uh, come up with that uh, result. So I, uh, I wonder, the question is whether there is, if there is actually a debate or uh, a road to follow in order to actually contest that. Yeah. Okay, can I, can I ask? Can I answer? Mm -hmm. I'm going to let him answer my question. <laughs> okay, so just to go, go, working backwards, I think you know a constitution say what constitutional uh, lawyers and, and constitutional courts say they say. And the Spanish Constitution, Article Two, is pretty clear about the uh, about the indissolvable unity of, of, of Spain. But nonetheless, on the question of whether or not there can be a referendum, I think you're right. I think there is wiggle room. Although ultimately you have to have, a, 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 it's difficult to try to change the, the constitution to get that possibility for the referendum and the lead independence. But I think we, we we definitely need people to start thinking a little bit flexibly about what the constitution says. That's why I was suggesting, like, remember the spirit of the constitution. The spirit of the constitution is that we need to accommodate the, the nationalisms and we have to make it so that not, neither Spanish nationalism nor Catalan nationalism get everything that they want. So something like that. So I think you're. I think we need to move in a flexible interpretation. And there, I think the fact that the judiciary is one of the most conservative uh, uh, segments of Spanish society is a real problem. So I think the uh, what you're calling the politicized judiciary, I think, really does get in the way. It's a politicized judiciary, but it's also a very highly legalistic interpretation of what the Constitution stands for. Um, uh, that cuts against the democracy. Uh, with respect to the question of uh, how is it possible that these, uh, these, these, these uh, intense preferences are generated, I think one thing that's really important is that uh, I, I, I uh, uh, asked a lot of people in, uh, uh, a lot of politicians, we asked a lot of politicians back in 2010 how they felt. And back in 2010, convergencia politicians, there was a generational shift. You could really see that they were very much in favor of independence before, and I think that the public switch over to independence on the part of Convergencia Union has a has a lot to do with it has a lot to do. It's a combination of the sentencia of 2010 uh, and the public shift of Convergencia, and then the regional media. I think there, I think they're right about that. That that, that those so it's 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 a sense that 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 federal route that was tried got smashed down and their leaders were pushing for independence, and they were hearing the message of independence is the only way, and uh, then there's something endogenous to the mobilization 
there's a collective mobilization, there's a sense of, uh, it's very powerful thing, you know, <laughs> with, these, with these millions of people on the street, there's a, something that happens that takes something that was latent and makes it manifest. And once, as you say, it's like a little bit like a toothpaste thing, once it goes out, it's hard to get back in. You know? uh, so I think there's something like that. <laughs> the repression, and then the repression, the repression, I think, is, is from the standpoint of people who really care about the unity of Spain, the, the repression is the dumbest thing they could have possibly done. Because now you have a whole generation of people who, what they see is that Spain is about smashing grandmas, you know, this kind of thing. It's really, really stupid, really stupid, I think. Um, from the standpoint of the longer term viability of, of recomposing some kind of federal majority. Uh, with respect to it, has the independence movement moved to the left? I think, uh, it, it, I agree with you that Esquerra Republicana is, uh, definitely has, been, has, has said things in favor of austerity, uh, but I do think that there is uh, a partisan politic thing, but there's also, a, a, there's also a politics of the street. And what you see, for example, with the, the, uh, the presence of the coup on the, in the street, the presence of the, 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 the Comité de Defensa Republica, you see within Catalan nationalism, those kinds of left-wing things are a lot more uh, visible than they ever were before. So I, but I definitely think you're absolutely right. Ultimately, ultimately, they have a very difficult time selling that left-wing project to the traditional left-wing base, which would be the working class metropolitan region. And there I think what you see is something that is very clear that didn't come up. If you ask people left to right, if you ask this support for independence left to right, you see very clear the farther to the left you are, the more you support independence. So as an identity, a kind of left-wing versus right-wing, it's very clear that, Catalan, that the Catalan nationalist cause of independence is something that is uh, most attractive to people who are, the farther to the left you are on the spectrum, the more attractive it is to you. So in that respect, there's been a, there's been a clear ideological move, which were convergencia for years, we, I called it you know, a center-right coalition, and it's hard, to, it's hard to call Catalan nationalism center-right anymore. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just a, it's more. One, one last thing, I'll, I'll finish, I'll finish. What's the root cause? Yeah. One thing that we haven't talked about at all, I do think ultimately, uh, uh, ultimately the, the generation of uh, Catalan nationalist identity was very much reinforced by Frankist repression. And so this is part of the reason why I say the idea that more repression is going to lead to a comment, is going to lead to anything but intensifying sentiment for independence. You wouldn't have such strong Catalan national sentiment if there wasn't a, a legacy of fascist repression of Catalan identity. And so this is why it seems to me the stupidest thing possible that the way to deal with middle classes in the streets is to beat them up. Anyhow. Is it gotcha. one of the independent countries? Is it the case Catalan was uh, independent country or not? Is that a problem? Well, there was never Catalonia, but there was the crown of Aragon that had some kind of independence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just one comment, because uh, it's saying right, mm -hmm. uh, left wing is pro independent. Uh, left, left, uh, left. Uh, I think it's a confusion of what is right and left. It may be you see, Esquerra Republicana has the name Esquerra, but it's not uh, a, a left <laughs> party. I, I, I know many people, I know people who were them on, uh, in this Committee of Defense of the Republic, which they voted at Convergencia, Catalonia, and which they are the retired people that they have been in Convergencia, But if you ask them, but, I, I, but, but, but if you ask people. them. So, so it's, uh, it's confusion. And then the, the idea of repression associated with Franco, that is building up this kind of cloud, which is masquerading. <laughs> I think the, 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 the real issue here, which is so uh, educated middle class people that they decided on 2012, uh, on, 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 uh, on the 12th, to, to, to shift to independentists. And they were, in fact, the, the, the conservative party, Convergencia Democratica. Well, so, so the, <laughs> And I, I just get lost on the on the on, on the issue. Like on the issue, when you, I mean, I'm Democrat enough to, to believe that if you ask someone on a scale of one to ten, left to right, how do you identify? That I listen to them. If they identify on the on the left, I said, well, these must be, be people whose identity is left wing. And then furthermore, if you ask the kinds of questions that Sergey's looking at, things that we generally yeah. think is a liberal thing. It's, like, it's, it's, Caroline, it's relatively clear. Caroline has me to say something. Yeah. I, I'll go back to you. Well, okay. I was actually going to um, 
answer on a, on a different thing, so I'll shift away so we'll move away from the polemic a bit. Um, I wanted to go back to the question that um, Mary raised before about uh, austerity and what the link is to austerity. I mean, personally, I feel that, um, that the financial crisis has not caused the Catalan independence movement, but it has accelerated yeah. it. Um, uh, the, the origins stem from before that, but it has accelerated it. But I think one of the things that I find most interesting, looking at it as an outsider, is that you know in the wake of the financial crisis, it was the EU that was imposing on Eurozone countries costs, yeah. basically. It was the EU that was telling Spain, you must rein, it was the EU first and foremost that was telling the Spanish central government, you must rein in regional government budgets because it was the regional debt that was ballooning far faster than the, the, mm. the, the, the central government debt. Um, now, the reaction from Catalonia was first and foremost to blame Spain rather than blaming the EU. And that's understandable in the sense that um, the, in, when the, the Spanish central government decided how to divide up the allowed, amount of deficit allowed, they shifted most of the burden of fiscal adjustment onto the regions, and the regions therefore had to, which are the, you know, responsible for the things which are most hardest to cut, like health, education, social services, they're the difficult things to cut. They had to make more of an adjustment. But I think it's interesting that, um, Oh, therefore, it's understandable that the reaction from regional governments was to blame the central government, including mm. um, the, the Catalan regional government blaming the central government. But I find it, do find it interesting that it yeah. didn't inspire more of a reaction against it's the Europe. EU as well, because it was actually the EU, you know, there's a, I looked into this quite in depth, and there were EU authorities telling Spain, central government, you must rein in regional, yeah. regional government budgets. Yeah. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting kind of... Um, Dilemma, but Very that emerged. Nice. That was just something I wanted to raise on the subject of austerity. Yeah, yeah thank you. <clears throat> just speaking up on a couple of questions, by May, uh, I thought I thought the question on the the constitutional argument was 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 very relevant. Yeah. So I think that on, on the one hand. Uh, uh, the question pointed out to, to a grey area, which is actually very very interesting. So on the one hand, it's not illegal to organize a referendum, but then the second article of the constitution makes it illegal to to break the nation. Right. So there's a bit of a grey area there. And this is why some legal experts were like, well, then why are we jailing uh, elected officials for 13 years if the sentence itself acknowledges that they actually were not after breaking the nation? That was just a, a mechanism of pressure to sit down and negotiate, right? Mm -hmm. This is what the sentence says. And this is why this is generating a lot of legal controversy, and perhaps legal experts can help us here. What I can say, though, is that I never fully followed, and I tried, uh, the constitutional argument as such, like, look, this is not possible because the Constitution does not allow it. This is, uh, while I understand the logic of this, uh, when looking at comparable cases, the Canadian case and the Scottish case, you know, those things were not allowed, and there is a point in which they are allowed, and there is political agreement and, and, and consensus. So from a liberal democratic perspective, constitutional arrangements reflect new discussions rather than prevent them, right? So this is why I never fully understood this constitutional sort of like argument. And then the classical, I guess, uh, argument is like, well, constitutionally, for example, the UK is different, right? Because it's a bit more multinational. Well, was it? I don't know. I remember in the 60s and 70s how the UK treated the Northern Irish context. Yeah. Was that a multinational way to treat, uh, I don't know. However, at some point, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, at some point, there was a, a political process with international mediation that said, guys, we actually need to change it. And what was the one thing that truly changed and brought down the conflict? The right of self-determination. Because after all, the Good Friday Agreement is this. It's saying, guys, you are a community. You need power sharing arrangements. And if at some point there's an indication that the, the shift in public opinion changes, you guys need to do a referendum. This is what the Good Friday Agreement is about. This is how the conflict came to an end. Uh, for now, yeah, in a very precarious <laughs> Uh, I have other answers. Do I have time to pick up on the, the federalism? The federalism. I thought that was is exactly what I wanted to talk about. I thought it was a, a very important question. And I think you're right that, so federalism is two things, uh, I think, from a political science perspective. Self-rule, meaning regions want more stuff for them, more resources, they want to control their hospitals, their prisons, they want their taxes. But true federalism is also shared rule, which is what you were referring to. Uh, a Bundesrat, or a Senate in the US, yeah? So suddenly regions, shape national legislation. It's true, I think, what you're saying, that the nationalists or the, cap the pro sovereignty Catalan project focus more on self-rule than on shared rule, yeah? And I think that's true. Uh, the self-rule aspect in terms of collecting taxes and everything that was suggested the last decade 
was not even close to what the Basques and Navarrans have now. This is why, from the perspective of the movement, is like, guys, we're asking something that is not even that revolutionary. We are already applying this within Spain. We would like the same. And then the response was like, no, sorry, you can't. So this is why the grievance or whatever was interpreted in this way. My worry, though, is not so much how the pro-sovereignty movement, uh, how the sovereignty movement considers uh, federalism. I actually think that at the moment that ship has sailed. But my question is, is anybody really in the Spanish political spectrum amongst the Spanish elites truly federalist? Uh, and I actually think that sometimes we need to understand what federalism means. Federalism means that regional inequalities will exacerbate. This is what federalism is. This means that the rich regions will collect more of their taxes, they will have more power, and there's going to be less inter-regional redistribution. This is what fed, true federalism is. And I think that the word sounds very nice, but once we actually put on paper what it means, then I don't think that the median Spanish voter or any political party is ready to assume that electoral cost. Yeah, both. Me? Yes. Uh, one point, very brief. C Catalonia is a rich and advanced society. And the majoritarian class, I'm, I'm convinced that you will agree with me <coughs> completely, is uh, mainly conservative on economic uh, options, but widely, uh, glamorously left on attitudes. Uh, and it's a combination of that. Uh, second, second is the desire. The desire. Give the British people as many referendums as they want, but sophisticated referendums. <laughs> and give Catalan people as many references as they want, and the Spanish people as well. And the third, always remind and, and have in mind Texas. On those questions, it's always necessary to think in Texas. Texas has recognized in the Constitution of the United States the uh, possibility to ask for living. And they have, there have been secessionist parties always in Texas. They've never uh, opted for that. But then there is the sophistication that the union will decide also. Okay? Yeah, yeah I, I would want to pick up on the question raised by Tony on Jeffrey. In fact, but I, I, he said, uh, what make? Because what we really need to understand is what has, you see, we, we had a, a period in Catalonia that you, you had people who were independentists, but they never thought on, uh, there the, the was not a uh, uh, take action on that. And, uh, and Esquerra Republicana was very independentist, mm -hmm. and uh, Convergencia was uh, uh, just uh, didn't believe on that. And suddenly, at a certain point, in uh, 2012, the elections of 25 N, which appears on our graphs always as a dividing point on the, on the dynamic multidimensional graph, that's the dividing point for the Catalan people, especially for those who, well, for the Catalan, finally, the, for the Catalan people who finally with this Catalan, and uh, that's watch TV. And radio. So we, in fact, what we aim at is to understand uh, whether there was something beyond left and uh, left and right and, and, and so on, who that could have uh, initiated the trouble and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the conflict uh, at the uh, high tension we have now. And uh, my my question is. Would that be impossible, uh, or we would be on that tension if Generalitat in Catalonia, the government was, uh, was uh, had the majority, has, has uh, government by the independents, the, whether the Generalitat de Catalonia would have been neutral in this point, which is what makes the people who is silent, who demonstrated and not 
and you can say that most came from outside, and that's not true. <laughs> Many people, well, we were there. The, the issue is, there is one part of Catalonia, the citizens, who make a lot of noise. And they are polarized at, at the top. And you say, well, maybe even if there is 30 percent very polarized, that can may have more power, and uh, democracy can, yeah, can be argued. Uh, you see, this kind of um, uh, make myself uh, uh, worried about the sense of the democracy because uh, you have to count the list. Uh, part of Catalan citizens, they have been silent, not because they are not caring about that. They are educated or, or not. Uh, they don't have the, the, the government uh, taking uh, partisanship on that issue. And I think that's... The Spanish that's, government. They got the Spanish government. No, 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 because we have the status quo. Can I, can I just you see, the, 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 the Catalan government is partisan, yes or not? Everybody so is the Spanish government. The Spanish it, government it, has yeah. been partisan too the whole time. I mean, both, si both sides have a government that is partisan in their favor. But the, but the, but the Catalan government is a government for all the Catalans, not only for that minority. The Spanish mm -hmm. government is a government for all the Spaniards. <laughs> so, but maybe the issue, yeah, uh, the issue we came is what is the what is the is the role of the Catalan uh, general? The Catalan general has been elected under the laws, which is the constitution. <laughs> Albert, can, can, just so, a couple more questions and then we, because we're going to have to okay. okay. yeah. I was wondering if shouldn't these silence people from Catalonia, who say there's so many, if they want representation, shouldn't they vote for their parties? So, could you repeat the question again? Yes. So these silent people in Catalonia, if they want representation in Parliament, so that you know, that is not so biased, let's say, shouldn't these silent people vote, if there's so many, mm. vote for their parties to balance the Just wondering. Well, this is what they are now going to do. Because I, they, they were, in, you see. I can see this happening in the elections, though. No, in, in, for, maybe there is one issue which was reflected on the, on the, on the data of elections that during some period, the, the Catalans who family mother language was Spanish, they were having uh, less participation to the autonomous to the, to the, to the uh, autonomous uh, elections. And they, there was a, a big shift. And that shift has now uh, diminished. And, uh, and, and, and you see, the, the part of Catalonia has always been having uh, an independentist uh, generalitat because there was a high extension in the in the site in the urban area, but, but in the, in the, which is in fact the, the leftist, the, the leftist part of the the workers. I think it's more complicated than that. I think a lot of people who are Spanish-speaking uh, working class people in Catalonia that are not in favor of independence, they also realize that Spanish nationalism has a really ugly past. They see, they see the rise of things like Vox and they don't want to be identified with that either. Yeah. And they kind of feel caught between two waves. But Vox and, is uh, just to... So, recent, recent well, yeah, year. recent years, but Spanish <laughs> nationalism is not just a recent thing. And so I think a lot of, I think a lot of these people that are not in, in favor of independence don't buy into the independentist story. They also don't buy into the Spanish right story about, what that, about their fate. I think it's more complicated. And let's, Caroline wants to say something else? Yeah. No, I was just going to go back to the point about shared rule that Sergey was talking about. And to be honest, I think there's, looking at it from the perspective of an outsider, um, what you see is that there have been, you know, when I'm talking to students about, you know, how Spanish politics works, one of the first things I mention is how often there have been minority governments in Spain that have worked, because this is just something that, to an outsider, is absolutely unbelievable. And so you have at times when you've had your Basque and Catalan nationalist parties have a huge amounts of influence over central government, and other times when they have absolutely no influence whatsoever. And there is no institutionalized mechanism to ensure that, that there is there is some form of shared power that withstands the political vagaries of the moment. And that is the problem. I mean, even if we look at you know, the Basque Economic Agreement, the Concierto Economico, which people have different views about, one of the, the reasons that the Basque nationalists like that so much is that there is, there is a 
it's a, there is a veto on both sides. The Spanish government cannot take any decision to, to change that legislation without the Basque government being in agreement. There is a mutual veto, and you know it needs both sides to be. That's where there is, where there is, there is a form of power sharing. But even then, it doesn't fully work because ultimately, the Basque nationalists government only ever gets the, the versions of the figures mm -hmm. that it wants at a time when the Spanish central government needs That's the BNV's right. support. So even then, the one form of institution that does have a form of mutual veto from both sides, um, a true power sharing in certain senses, ultimately ends up subject yeah. to the political vagaries of the moment. So I think that, looking at it from an outsider's perspective, that the problem is that has, and, and this goes back to what Mary was saying about um, about you know that sh what is what is sovereignty in this day and age, and and again I, I I think you learn a lot from speaking to Basque nationalists who are now no longer seeking independence as such. You know I'm talking about more like the BNP, um, and they say well you know what does independence mean nowadays? But we do want some sort of equal standing with the Spanish government. So it's more about having some way of institutionalising things so that it's not subject to the political vagaries at the moment. Is is my understanding of it. Can I just come, let's just say something about this issue of the Catalan, the general we, we, can you say no. something? We have, I think we're going to go, if we have not gone on offline. So, <laughs> yeah. because uh, formally I think this stopped streaming at 8, and uh, but at some point it will kick us out, but I mean, <laughs> okay. if you want, if you're happy to be on okay. this discussing, on okay. this <laughs> issue, on this Forget issue, about the streaming. on this issue about the general does not being neutral. I mean, the, the reality is that the, the, that the deal at the time of the transition to democracy was, that you get uh, autonomy, and in your autonomous institutions, if you can win majorities, you yeah. do with your autonomous institutions what you want. And the reality is, is that again and again and again, Catalan nationalists have won the autonomous elections, and that's why the Catalan nationalist uh, uh, forces that are in power, they push for whatever project they're pushing for. And in 2012, they won a majority on a, on a, on a, a, a platform that said we want independence. And so the reality is, that's, that's the reality. That's the interpretation. And there's other Catalans there. There are other Catalans, but that's not majority. Just to touch upon this and to push back a bit on this idea that the General Etat or the Catalan Parliament is not representative. Um, I actually think that, you know, first of all, the electoral rule that is used in the Catalan Parliament is the same as the Spanish electoral rule, and uh, the districts in Catalonia are bigger, which means that they generate more fragmented, more proportional outcomes. It's very easy for a new party to get into the Catalan Parliament. It's easier than in other regional parliaments. And then why is there a constant majority, parliamentary majority of nationalist forces? And that speaks to who these non-independencies are, and, and you, you have it in your graph. So it is correct to say that there's not a majority for independence in Catalonia. Let's say there's a 52, 55, 58, I don't know, percent of people who don't say, I want independence. But once you unpack them, these people are very different. So some of these people want hardline recentralization, a minority of them, some of them want status quo, some of them want decentralization, and a minority of them want referendum, but they are not independentists. So the fallacy of the silence majority, it is something that I just don't quite understand. Those people have a free and fair vote like everybody else, and if they don't build the majority, it's because they don't have the numbers. You have to wait, enough. you have to wait, because they, have, they, have major, they are mobilized that, thanks to the process. <laughs> yep. just, to clarify, just to clarify and give more data, which is very easy, on the last regional elections, the unionists won the elections. Yeah? You were asking that. They won the elections. The first party, by far, by far, and by far, they got the first position. The, the, the but, the, but not the majority, okay? But not the majority. But, well, uh, what matters is that much is the government. Second, that second thing. That's not how parliamentary no, 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 democracy is. No, 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 no,
Nobody discusses that. This is to get data because somebody asked it. And these people never mobilized, they mobilized. And they were the first. Uh, second, uh, the only uh, region in Spain that hasn't changed the electoral systems in order to create a more uh, representative uh, map of the uh, population of the region is Catalonia. All the other regions have changed the electoral law, but Catalonia has decided to use the same that the Spain uses in order to give much more representation to the uh, non-populated inland uh, pre previ previous, uh, previously uh, in, during the 20th century and 19th century, the more right-wing Catholic, ultra-Catholic and ultra-Orthodox people. That's the situation. To give you the map. The rural, I mean, the rural mm -hmm. representation. I think that's that's true, but I mean, it's 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 hardly something that is. Uh, well, first of all, it happens at the level of all of Spain, and it happens certainly in the United States, where if you look at the yeah, Senate, the kind of over yeah, representation right. of rural areas. It's quite normal in, in representative <laughs> democracies that you have an over representation of rural areas. Yeah. You can argue for a, a change, but it's difficult to get that change because the uh, status quo is what it is. But, but, the, the strange but I think the, rea the, the, the other regions but, need that. But the crucial, yeah, point, no, the no. crucial point is, and I think uh, here I agree with Sergi entirely, if there was a silent majority that really felt strongly uh, along the lines that we have been totally silenced here, it would manifest itself differently. I think what happens is that the, is that the people who are not in favor of independence, they feel a variety of different things. It's like, yeah, but I agree. And that, I think, so maybe it's not, it's not the silent majority, it's and a not coordinated uh, group of... Uh, That's right. It's not coordinated yeah. and it's also different kinds of sentiments towards Spanish nationalism, towards the left-right cleavage, and what you have is an intense, intense preference uh, of a group of people that are unified, and then you have a, a bunch of other people who and also... Left, and left, uh, so, can, can well, we fragment? We, we okay. finish. Yeah. Let, let me give you another, another date. Very short Just one. another date. Very, yeah. Very. Yeah. yeah. I introduce at the start, the example of French Catalonia, because the comparison is always important. Paris is very far, but Madrid is farther to the corners of Spain than Paris in France. And compared, for example, to London, London is almost uh, at walking distance to everybody in the British Islands. Madrid is like Moscow. Uh, so <laughs> the Spain, the the, go the, the the Spain's government is is very far to the end to the interest of the people, and the regional powers have attained a tremendous amount of really uh, power to intervene in the ordinary life of every audience, not only Catalonia, everywhere. Can I can I finish with that provocative question? Uh, because you mentioned the. Uh, unless somebody else has something. You mentioned, some, you mentioned uh, Northern Ireland and I, earlier, and you said like yeah. uh, somehow these kind of cleavage society, in a sense, have managed to, to reach uh, some sort of agreement, stability, by creating this kind of stalemate in, in which uh, both sides have a capacity to be to each other, and you know, being forced to be both represented in different institutions across uh, the, the, the region of the, the nation. Do you think that is a chance? I mean, I'm not saying this is a central scenario or anything, but do you think this is a chance to design some sort of arrangement? I mean, we, we see that it's not, they are not symmetric sites. So there are some sites that have been now clustered somehow according to a, a clear idea, a clear plan, while the other part has been idle, probably, or not so consent for, for a moment. But is there a way you see that uh, some arrangement could be introduced in order to make all sides to feel somehow more compelled to work together or to force to be together, or, or whether this is uh, something desirable or not, or, or whether this is something else yeah. to do. No, I think, I think that's a good point. So my example of Northern Ireland was just to illustrate that yeah. very hardline <laughs> approaches of a central government to a territorial conflict can change over time, you know, and that there's nothing in the British DNA that is more multinational, multicultural, and that even such a hard, such a brutal 
uh, conflict that the Northern Irish one can change with political will, despite what the law says. This was my only point. Apart from that, the comparisons between Northern Ireland and Catalonia are actually uh, scarce, I would yeah. say, and I wouldn't like to go beyond that, okay. that, that comparison. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, I actually think that going back to the ethno-nationalist kind of like uh, adjective, I think the Northern Ireland approaches that a bit more, yeah? Mm. So either you are on one camp or you are in the other. That is a divided society. Mm. You cannot jump from a Protestant Unionist to a Catholic Republican by sort of like over the, over the, over the course of your life. You, this is going to be determined by your community, by your family. That is an ethno-nationalist. But they are degrees. Catholic and Protestant. But they are degrees. They are always. Degrees. Always. They're, they're degrees. always. Always. But the Catalan, you know, I actually, I, I'm, this, this, this image of the Catalan society being so divided and all of this, I understand where you guys are going with that. And I agree with the, with the role of identity and language and all of this. But those identities are more malleable. Mm. This is what you show. Yeah. This is mm. what you show. You show that over the last decade, many people who felt a little bit in between jumped to the Catalan and there is a bit of fluctuation. Yeah. That is, by definition, not an ethno-nationalist yeah. conflict. Those identities are more malleable. And as I tried to illustrate before, these only Catalan people who are they are, they, are, they are not the typical essentialist exclusive identity people because of their levels of education, their income, and their social cultural values. They might be nationalists, but not that exclusive identity. So do you think they could, uh, they could at some point embrace back or accept uh, overlapping identity and, and, and jump back into a, a common project? Or do yes. you think that's not I mean, I think, I think the issue, I think it seems pretty clear that there's not a majority in favor of independence, so why is everyone so afraid of a referendum? Mm -hmm. yep. A referendum is the well, way we live in the UK. <laughs> because we don't have, we don't have <laughs> examples of a referendum. But, uh, but, but one well, point, one issue, I, I would just put. Well, the, the, the Scottish <laughs> referendum is a good example. Uh, uh, Nobody complains about that one. Yes. Yeah. The, the, what you see that there is a, a leakage from uh, one side to the other, that was not so. Don't get confused with the, with, the, with the data. The data is very clear that there is a big difference. Of course there is a leakage, and especially with the media. From a stop. That's what, the, what, he's, what he's saying. And, and that's the, what we show is a clear uh, division there. And if I go to my town, I see that. I could put a line. Mm -hmm. And the independentists are on the, on the, on the single houses uh, in the organizaciones. Mm -hmm. The left wing. <laughs> yes. And the others are in the That's the And that's what I say that these measures of left and right wing, I think, have to be somewhat revised. We can we can get make a collaboration on that. I'm gonna I'm gonna close the session here, but Adolf has said that he has some small thing to give hope, <laughs> some positive uh, yeah. outlook. So, yeah. Because it's a positive one, I'm going to let him give it. I want to give you all hope on that. <laughs> because, no, I'm always an, an optimistic, a bit always illusory man. 